My name is Aaron Blaze. Um, I've been an animator, a character designer, artist, you know, professionally for 40 years. And uh, I've been an animator for 35. And uh, along that time, 21 of those years was spent at Walt Disney Feature Animation. And so I worked on a lot of films that probably a lot of you guys grew up on. I worked on Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King and Aladdin and Pocahontas and Mulan and directed Brother Bear and all kinds of stuff. And, um, and a lot during that time, uh, as an animator, I was also a supervising animator. And as a supervising animator, back in those days, we were drawing on paper and all that, um, uh, I also, we also were responsible for designing our characters. We, you know, we, we designed our characters for the films. And then we uh, and then we animated them and, and supervised. You know, quite often we had several animators working with us on a character, and so it would be up to me to uh, whatever character I was supervising to supervise that animation along with doing my own. Um, but before all that, we like I said, we had to design our characters, and so and so in designing the characters over the years, I've come up with a lot of you know kind of little rules that I um, that I follow for myself. And uh, I, you know, when I do lectures like this, I like to, to share them with, we, with you. So I put them together in a little presentation here. And, um, and it's, I, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to take you through a lot of the characters that I've done over the years and, um, and just take you through my approach. Uh, before I get started, I just want to let you know, you know, tomorrow I'm going to be actually drawing and animating. Uh, so I'd love to see you guys there because you're going to get to see how I, you know, in this lecture, how I take all this stuff and utilize it in you know actual animation, 2D animation, which is where my heart still is. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So this is my approach to character design. And that's what I really wanna emphasize. This is my approach. There's a billion different ways that you can approach character design. It's, this is what works for me, okay? And, and I do it the same way every time because it just works and it cuts down on time and I'm able to turn characters around really fast, all right? So this is my approach. So the first thing I think about in character design, obviously, is appeal, all right? You want these characters to be appealing. Now, obviously, when we're talking about character design in this form, we're talking about visual character design. But it also helps, obviously, if you, if you have a very well-written character. And I want to get into that because um, explaining this, even villains have appeal, okay? It, it, to me, appeal doesn't mean cute and beautiful and all that. Obviously, appeal means interesting. Somebody you want to watch. Somebody you want to, you know, you want to find out what happens to this character. And that's why it really helps to have something that's well written so that you have something to grab hold of and to start pulling from and creating those visuals that you're going to ultimately put up on the screen, okay? If you look at these characters, I mean, these are all characters. And one of, the one of the things I love about good villains is just understanding a really good backstory. They're usually characters that you can actually empathize with a little bit. It's like, yeah, I understand why you're doing that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't snap my fingers and get rid of half the life in the universe, but <laughs> I understand why you're doing it. You know? And so you, it, it, I, I love characters like that. One of my favorite villains, not animated, was uh, Joaquin Phoenix in Gladiator. And he's just this horrible, evil character but you really understand he was a guy that was just trying to live up to his father's expe expectations, which for a lot of us, we all can, can relate to. So a lot of times, a really great villain you can just really relate to. I'm gonna put my spectacles on here. <laughs> so these are things that I think about to create more appealing characters. The first thing is, before I even put pencil to paper, before I ever start drawing, and I know so many of you, you, know, you get an idea for a character, you get an idea for something, you just wanna just jump in there and start drawing right away. I'm guilty of it as, next as, uh, as much as the next person. But the first thing I do is I really want to know, especially if I'm not working on my own project, if I'm working on someone else's project, like I did during the Disney days, um, I wanted to get to know that character. You know, I, I did uh, 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 Nala, let's say. I did young Nala for The Lion King. I didn't know who Nala was at the time. This is, you know, this some strange character. So the first thing I did was I asked to read the script. And so we would sit back, I'd, I'd take the script home and we'd read the script. And now, now I would understand, you know, I understood how this character, how she fit into the film and how she was a little sidekick to Simba and all the, you know, all the little, the quirks that went with her. And it started to paint a picture for me um, as I started to think about this character. And so I would take what was written in the script then I would take things that were familiar to me. You know, my daughter, who was only three at the time. My, it's funny, my daughter's 33 now. 
And uh, one of the things you'll see when I pitch here, she um, she had these big eyes, and I I really took I, I looked at her and I put her eyes into into Nala, and my daughter still tells everybody that she's Nala from The Lion King. So <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, but it's research too. So one of the biggest things, and this is one of the things that I love about Disney, I love about Pixar, DreamWorks, a lot of the big studios that have the bil the ability to do this and the time. And if you you know take the time if you can, you have to do this. Um, but research, I don't care if you're designing for SpongeBob SquarePants, research sponges, research under the ocean. The more you know, the more you grow. The more you know, the more you can draw and, and, and design and everything else. And so um, it's not just knowledge, you know, uh, academic knowledge that really helps, but it's ob obviously visual knowledge. And so uh, here's some examples from The Lion King. Uh, these are sketches that I did very early on before I ever started designing the characters. We, we sat out on the little back sound stage out on the lot. And they brought lions in, you know, full-grown lions, lion cubs. And at the time, I was a young, I was 22, 23 years old, and I really didn't know my anatomy very well. And so this was my first real introduction to getting some good, strong anatomy chops and, you know, locked into my brain so that I could, you know, animate it in a film. And so I really sat there and studied and photographed and did everything I could to, uh, to get this burned into my brain. And, um, and so many of us, you know, if you don't do the research, you end up drawing the idea of what you think something is, you know. We'll struggle, you know, I have so many people ask me, because I do a lot of animal drawing now. You know, you know I, I struggle so much with the anatomy. Well, of course you do, we all did. And, but it's not until you sit down and you study with it and you, and you work it and you get it burned into your brain that, that you'll be able to, uh, you know, do it without as much struggle. Well, an example I always use is, you know, if you ask a, a little five-year-old kid to sit down and, and draw a tree, 100% of the time, pretty much, they'll sit down and they'll, they'll draw you the idea, the idea of a tree. It's two bent lines and big squiggly up on top, you know, and that's a tree. But then if you take that same little kid, even at five years old, you can take them outside and sit them in a chair and say, look at this tree. This is a tree. Now I want you to draw what you see. Now, they, they're not going to do a beautiful drawing. They're five years old, but they're not going to do a little squiggly line either. They're going to draw what they see, and that visual is going to be burned into their brain. And that idea is the same idea with character design. When you get in there and you do your research, you go to the zoo or you go wherever it is that you need to go in order to get the information for the character that you're creating, that's going to be burned into your brain. And it's not just burned into your brain for that character. It's burned into your brain forever. And you're going to, uh, you know, over time, I'm 54 years old, and my library is, you know, bursting. And, and, and I know if I make it to 80 or 90 or, or whatever, it's going to be even bigger. I'm constantly, constantly studying. That's such a big part of what we do as artists. It's not just sitting there and learning new techniques on doing this or that. It's gathering knowledge. you got to, you know, just be a student. Always be a student. That's my big lecture for the day. But um, this is Chewy. I love this guy. He, um, this is pretty much all he did the whole time. <laughs> but, uh, but it was really great because it was really fun to get the weight and the attitude and all this kind of stuff. These are just mundane little sketches, but what they do is they really burn these little things into your brain. Just little things like in, in the lower right, you can see the way his hips. He was a young lion, so he's kind of gangly, and I could see a lot of his anatomy. I could see the tendons in his Achilles heel there up on, the, uh, on his leg. And, uh, you know, the way his chin hung off the edge of the stage, all these little things that just, you know, burn their, like I said, burn their way in. His hips there, all this stuff, the way he bent down to drink water, you know, little tiny things. And then you take all that and you extrapolate from it. You, you, you take the stuff you want, you get rid of the stuff you don't need, you push the stuff you want, you start pushing the caricature, and you start ending up with things like this. Now, this is obviously a cartoon character, but it's based on the things that I learned while observing and, s and researching real lions. And the more I refined her, she got a little bit more sophisticated in the way she was designed. And ultimately, she became the character that we know in the film, Nala. And uh, one of the, the drawings I always point out here is, you know, in this, this one here, uh, on the, in the, the lower drawing, we're, we're looking at her from behind. It's a s really simple drawing, but there's so many things in there that ended up in that simple little drawing from observation. If you look at her shoulder blades, how the shoulder blades are pushed, you know, one has more weight on it than the other. Her hips, the way her ankles come together, 
Um, you know, all these little details that we take for granted when we watch the film, but it really came from, you know, looking and observing and, and learning. So there she is, a little Nala. So the next character, um, well actually the character I did before Nala, I did Raja the Tiger from Aladdin. And that was the first character that Disney ever gave me to design. And uh, it was a small role, tiny, but I really took it to heart. And, um, and I really wanted to do something really cool with it. And so these are sketches that I did. I went out and drew lion or tigers every chance I got. Once again, going back to research, research, research. And uh, did tons and tons of these drawings of action analysis. And out of that, I started doing these little pen drawings. Now, Aladdin, and this is another thing to think about, and I'll, I'll get into this later on. Another thing to think about in character design, especially when you're working on someone else's film, is the design conceit for that film, the art direction. Um, every film we ever worked on had a different art direction to it. And Aladdin was, uh, uh, the design was geared after, um, uh, geez, I can't remember his name, the, the character artist. Hirschfeld. Thank you, Hirschfeld. It's blowing up my mind there. So, um, so Al Hirschfeld was, a, if you guys don't know Al Hirschfeld, he was a really cool uh, caricature artist uh, from the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, did these really beautiful fluid uh, drawings. And if you look at the genie from Aladdin, that's a perfect Hirschfeld design right there. And so I had to take, you know, the struggle for me in this was taking, oh, let me get rid of that, sorry. The toners, oh, there it is. Um, it was taking that, the big bulky muscular cat, you know, that I had in my head and creating this really fluid, elegant design. And I really struggled with it. And, uh, and so these are some of the early pen sketches I did. And it's funny, th another thing I want to emphasize to you guys is just being keeping your mind open at all times. Just keep it open because you never know when inspiration is going to hit you. And so I was walking down the road, and uh, we're coming back from lunch, and there's all these cars parked along the road. And I saw this hood ornament on this car. It was a Jaguar. And I was like, that's what I'm looking for. Oh, my God. I sat, got down, started looking at it before camera phones and all that. But I just, I really kind of soaked it in. And uh, I went back to the studio and just started drawing what I had in my head by looking at this hood ornament on this Jaguar. And within a couple of days, I had a design that I really liked for Raja, and I had him approved by the director. So, you know, I sat there for a couple of weeks just stumbling over stumbling and stumbling and stumbling until I came across this crazy hood ornament on a car so just you know you never know where you're going to get your inspiration so there he is so these are some of the things that I think about and I think you guys need to know or I, I, I need to know and I'm passing it on to you guys um, along with uh, you know getting some character design done so understanding real world anatomy and this is what I was going talking about even with Spongebob if you understand how sponges are made if you understand how fishes you know swim in the ocean understand how how we move, um, I don't care how cartoony you make your character, you're, you're starting from an area of reality and you're going to extrapolate and you're going to create something that's even more believable, even if you're pushing that, that caricature. So, you know, I'm always doing an, uh, anatomy studies, whether they're human, animal, always just trying to fill my brain with everything I can um, related to that because obviously, um, especially as a 2D an artist and animator myself, um, getting in there and, you know, thinking three-dimensionally, taking a complex shape or, or character that has complex shapes like a fawn uh, and turning that in space and understanding, you know, that anatomy, that it takes work, it takes study. And so the more you know, like I said, you know, the better off you're going to be. One of the things we always talked about, especially in the, in the old 2D, day, 2D days, um, you know, a lot of people in the, in the industry don't now, outside the design phase of things, and we're, I know, and I know we're talking about a design class right now. But once you kind of break out out of the design phase of things and get more into the production, uh, nowadays, it, you know, the ability to draw, you don't have to be, be able to draw as much, especially in the 3D world. I know a lot of 3D animators that don't draw. But, um, but back in, you know, back when we were doing, you know, these other films, drawing was our language. It's the only way we could communicate with each other. And so the more you can do it, especially in design, the better off you're going to be because that, you know, 
me, what I'm doing right now is secondary to what you see up on the screen. That's going to be your primary language. And so as be, being as clear as you can um, with your drawing and anatomy, you know, understanding anatomy and, and, and those things, are, it's going to help you down the road. I'm going to get into some basic stuff that you guys will probably already know, but I'm, it's, uh, it's all 101 kind of stuff because I know a lot of people forget it, and that's silhouette. You know, understanding silhouette and the clarity of silhouette and posing your characters when you're trying to get, uh, a, let's say, a design across. Um, the clearer your silhouette can be, the better off you're going to be. And a super, super basic example of this is this character, the, this figure up on the screen. You look at it from the side and you don't get nearly the amount of information as you do from that front. I know it's all you know, twinned and everything else, but you at least get all the information. So same thing with the, the, the image on the left compared to the image on the right. Always try to find that, that the clearest silhouette you can. Now I understand there's going to be times when, in a, like in this example, where you, have to ha you might have to have a character pushing away or, or something like that. But the, you know, if you have the ability, clear out that silhouette if you can. Same here, you know, the, the image on the left looks like she's got an arm sticking out of her back or something. It's hard to understand what's going on or something growing out of her head. But you at least, you get a better sense and you get a better gesture, you know, when you look at that, that image on the right. Same thing here. You know, look at the negative spaces. You know, when you can, op you can open up negative spaces in your silhouette, that's always going to be clearer, okay? Here's some quick examples of clarity of silhouette once again. Once again, just getting the more, the more you can get that full gesture, uh, describing the idea, the emotion, you know, everything that's coming across, the better off you're going to be, okay? Line of action. So these are all things we talk about. You know, it's 101, you know, when you're learning figure, in you know, figure class, if you ever took figure in the college. Um, but it all goes into character design. Finding that strong line of action, especially when you're creating your characters and you're trying to get a story across, get some action, get something dynamic. Um, a strong line of action will always make your image more dynamic and more exciting and it gets the story across a lot more clearly. You know, if you look at the drawing in the upper left, you've got that line of action going all the way from his right foot all the way through the end of his fist. And, uh, and you know, and variations on that idea all the way through. Okay? You guys familiar with straights and curves? Yeah? Good. Keep, you use them. You know, it could, uh, you know it's funny. It, what I, uh, are you, do you guys know who Walt Stanchfield was? You ever heard of Walt Stanchfield? Walt Stanchfield was a guy that worked at Disney years and years and years ago. And um, uh, I was lucky enough when I came into the industry back in the mid 80s to, to take classes from him. And he always pushed straights and curves. You know, it really helped with clarity of uh, um, posing. And um, I always thought it was a gimmick. I thought I, you know, I, I did it and I thought it was cool. And I found it fascinating how it did make my drawing stronger. But I thought it was a gimmick until I really started looking and seeing it in nature. You really see it, you know, it really happens in nature. And so, you know, anytime you can create, well, first of all, we react to contrast. That's the, you know, as humans, we react to contrast, right down to the minute detail. And so con straights and curves are kind of a variation on that idea of contrast. You have these contrasting sides, one's curved, one's straight, and it creates a, a bit of a rhythm. And when you can alternate them and get things to flow through your posing, you're going to end up with something that's really dynamic and interesting to look at. If you look at the examples on the on the left, um, I've got one that's all straights, one that's all curved. The one that's all curves looks like the Michelin Man, but then you kind of combine the two up on the top, and you end up with something that has strength to the pose, makes it a bit more dynamic. Oh, by the way, too, as I'm talking, don't be afraid to to interrupt, ask questions, whatever. I like to keep it nice and simple. Is that me? Oh, thanks. Sorry. Oh, wh what was that? <laughs> oh, that's weird. <laughs> Did I do something? That was weird. Yeah, I, I thought it was someone's phone going off. So the whole time I was talking, you guys weren't looking at that, right? <laughs> oh, sorry. So straights and curves. There you go. <laughs> So, like, in, so in this dancer, I, you heard me talking about the example on the left. They the got the Michelin Man on the bottom, but when you combine the straights and the curves, you end up with something a bit more dynamic up on the top. And if you look at the the dancer on the right, you really can go through an entire figure and create that entire thing with straights and curves all the way through, 
and you create something that's really dynamic and fun to look at. So there you go. Yes. I did a little bit of freelance back in the early days. I animated a character named Marsupilami <laughs> way back in the days. But I didn't do a lot for TV, no. I, I, I spent 99% of my work it was in feature animation. Yeah. Um, but you'll see a little bit. Of, I, I, after Disney, I got into some commercial stuff. Um, overlapping shapes. Overlapping shapes are a way, you know, there's different ways that we see perspective. And, uh, and then we get perspective across. There's um, obviously there's uh, linear perspective where things as they, you know, lines as they recede or, or objects as they recede get smaller. Okay, so you can look at size. There's atmospheric perspective. As things get further away, we get more and more haze and their values become closer and closer together. Another way of, of looking at perspective is, is overlapping shapes. You see my hand and this hand here, this hand's overlapping the one here so you know it's closer. Our brain just automatically realizes that. So it's amazing how many people don't think about that when they're, when they're creating their characters. So the more you can even subtly overlap your shapes, you end up uh, creating depth in your posing and, and in, the, in the world that you're creating. And so these are some examples of that. If you look at the character that's walking towards camera, just finding those, those areas where you know, the different parts of the body overlap and overlap them in the right way, all of a sudden you create the perspective working in the way that you want it to work. You know, the, there's really nothing other than the op overlapping shapes in that lower left drawing that if you took those overlapping, if you took the lines out you know, inside, there would be nothing to tell you what's going back and what's coming forward. Nothing other than maybe a little bit of size on the arms. But add those overlapping shapes and all of a sudden you've got a lot of depth happening in there, okay? Same thing here. This is some character design I was doing for another project way back and I wanted something really dynamic. So this was a quick sketch I did for an idea. Oh, that one? I don't know why this is doing that. It's really weird because it should just be a direct link. Sorry, guys. So avoiding evenness. This is one that I talk about a lot. Um, matter of fact, I, I did a, uh, I have this thing on YouTube, Aaron's Art Tips, that I started about 10 years ago. This is the first thing I talked about. Um, you know, when you listen to music, anything that's really boring is just blah, 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 that's, and it's even, right? Super even. Well, it, it, we react to stuff like that, you know, with our ears, but we also react to things like that with our eyes. And, um, if something's even, we get really bored with it. So you want to push the dynamics of your pose, your, the, the, the proportions, those types of things. So if you look at the character in the over, over on the left, it's, it's a cool character, this Viking type guy, um, but it's all really even. And, and, and actually, and for a certain world, it might fit within a certain world. But if you have the ability, you know, I'd like, I, I really wanted to push who he was. And so I pushed a lot of his proportions to create something that was a lot more dynamic and a lot more interesting to look at in my mind. And so, you know, rather than having his waist right halfway through his body, I dropped his waist and gave him a, a giant barrel chest and kind of shrunk his head a little bit and, you know, just did these, these little things to push proportion here and there to create something that for me was more interesting. Pushing your design, and this is very similar to what I was just talking about, but pushing designs in ways that are gonna take, uh, show character, show attitude, you know, the upper right hand drawing is, is basically the drawing of a real bear. But the one in the top, I wanted something that was kind of a bully, kind of a burly, uh, mean type bear. So I created something that was more husky and, and, you know, smaller cranium and all that kind of stuff. Bigger feet. And then obviously, you know, the, the character over on the left, he's had a lot of salmon. You know, <laughs> he's had a good day at the salmon run. So, uh, and then, you know, the guy on the right, these are early ideas that I had done for Brother Bear for different characters. And, um, and you know, we had, we had to populate that movie with 200, 300 different bears and make them all different, you know? And so how do you do that when, uh, you know, us as humans, we look at bears, a black bear, a grizzly bear, they're all, you know, basically they look the same. Uh, so you gotta, you gotta really find ways to make them different. Um, one of the things I love to do is just sit down and when I doodle and, and play with proportions, pay, play with design and just sit there and just doodle faces and bodies and characters and, 
And it's a fun habit to get into because you make little discoveries that you can kind of block away and use later on. Uh, so, you know, these I, I, I like to include them because a lot of times these are, like if I'm sitting on my Cintiq and I'm talking to the bank or whatever on the phone and I'm, you know, I'm sitting there doodling and I'll come up with little characters that I like to kind of put off to the side. That's where these characters come up and come from. So keeping, this is another one that I see a lot of, and that's uh, expression. A lot of people struggle with expression. And um, are you guys, do you guys know who Mark Henn is? You ever heard of Mark Henn? Mark Henn's a, a Disney animator. He's one of the few 2D animators that's still at Disney. And um, uh, he, was the, he was the supervising animator of Young Simba, you know. For, for everybody that saw Simba trying to wake up Mufasa when he's got run over by all the wildebeest and made you cry, that's Mark Henn did that to you. So <laughs> it's funny, I just gave a lecture in Wyoming to a bunch of artists, and Mark Henn happened to be there, and I was giving the lecture where I was talking about that, that shot, and, um, and I called him out on it, and everybody just turned their heads and <laughs> pointed at him in the audience. <laughs> but um, but uh, I was a young animator, and I worked with him quite a bit. Uh, in Beauty and the Beast, he animated Belle, anima I animated Beast. I was animating Beast under Glenn Keane, but I was in Florida, Glenn was in California, and Mark and I were in Florida together. <coughs> and so I went to Mark a lot. You know, when I, did, when I did Raja, he did Jasmine. When I did Nala, he did Simba. So we, we did a lot of work together. I was in his office all the time, really learning a lot from him. And I remember going to him and struggling with some expressions. And um, the first thing he, I, I, we're t I, I think we were talking about a happy face. I was trying to get this happy expression on, on Raja, and I was having a hard time with the snout and everything. And the first thing he drew was this. He goes, Aaron, what's this? I said, it's, it's happy. It's a happy face. Everybody knows that. I don't care what language you speak, where you are in the world, you can look at that little icon and know that that's happy. And he says, that's the secret to, to your expressions. Put that into your expressions. Make your expressions simple. Get that simple icon in there so that, you know, underneath all the detail and the 3D form, you still have this, okay? And that's the key. Simple mouth shapes, simple eye expressions. The more complex you, the complexity you put in there, the more you water it down, okay? The more convoluted it becomes. So simplicity is the best. Angry, right? Boom, <laughs> angry. It's the same thing. Now I know these are cartoony and the cartoony examples, but even if you're doing realistic, more realistic type design, simple is always better, always. Oh, surprise. Yeah, so always remember that. That's a huge thing. And the other thing too, depending on the, the, uh, the broadness of what you're doing in your animation or your design, I should say, um, when I look at different expressions uh, of, of other students or, or young artists coming up to me looking, uh, looking at their portfolio, um, one of the most common, common, common things I see in, let's say they do a model sheet of different expressions for a character. And you'll see lots and lots of expression changes within the silhouette and no change in the silhouette whatsoever. An open mouth, ah, really big, is the same silhouette as a you know, clenched teeth. Very often, people forget to, you know, squash and stretch and, and push the silhouette in the head for expressions as well. So think about that as, as you're doing that. Just a few examples here as well. Same with animals. You know, people ask, you know, how do you get human expression into animals? It's really taking those simple, iconic ideas and just applying it to a different structure of, of face. But it's really, we get it in the eyes. You know, we, we read so much in our eyes we read a lot in the mouth. But so much is, is just eye and eyebrows. And so if you can get that on, a, on an animal character, you're 90% there. And uh, that's another thing, another example I use is, that, you know, especially when I'm drawing, is you can sit and you can adjust an eyebrow, a line width, and you can get a different thought, a different idea. You know, we're so used to reading faces. We're social creatures. And so, you know, the eyes, eyebrows, you know, those subtleties, well, here we go. That's the next thing we're talking about. The eyes are the windows of the soul. These subtle little changes will give you completely different thoughts and expressions and everything else. And coupling that with the mouth, 
um, you can come up with an infinite number of expressions, all very you know subtly different from one another. So that being said, really get in there and understand how does how do the eyes sit in the skull? How do they? How does all that work from just from a, a, a scientific anatomical standpoint, understanding all that so that you can move things around in a believable way. You know, you push beyond what we might be able to do anatomically, but you're at least pushing from what you already know. Making a clear statement. So we're, this is going to overlap a little bit of what we've I've, I've already talked about, but it's a little bit different. And what I'm saying is, and, and this it goes along with clear silhouette and everything else, but in this case, when I make it, when I'm talking about a clear statement, I'm talking about posing. Pose your character doing something, making, you know, this guy, he's mad at somebody and he's coming at him and he's got a, he's got a, you know, he's got a beef with somebody. Or he's, you know, any, any kind of pose, you know, he's sad, you know, shuffling along a path somewhere down the road, whatever. I get in there and I just scribble out these really messy gestures. You can always go back. I always say you can always go back and make a pretty drawing later. Make sure your initial pose, that initial sketch, is clear. Get in there and make it clear. Then you can go in and make it pretty. So going back to more uh, academic type ideas, constructing with simple shapes. Another question I always get is how do you, you, know, how do you take a character like in The Lion King and you're doing 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 drawings of that character and how do you make it the same, you know, and, and make it feel like it's the same from behind, from the side, different expressions, all of that. Well, you, we, we start with simple shapes. You know, Nala, for example, is, you know, a little ball on top of the tube for a neck and then I draw it the same way every time and, and construct that, that style that goes on her face and, and remember the proportions and you think about all those things, uh, but you keep it simple. I'm probably the... The most complex character I anima ever animated, I didn't design him, but I, I animated him with Beast uh, from Beauty and the Beast. But even he had these simple triangular shapes sitting, and, and I went through, when I would sat with Glenn Keane, who was the supervisor, and he would talk to us about how to draw, you know, we, you, it's all done with repetition. But would, they would start with these simple shapes like this, and then you would build on it until ultimately you had something that was more detailed, um, like in the film. But this character here who has all of these details, whoops, I don't know why it's not changing. There it is. All right. So take this character, for example. There's a lot of different expressions here. But he feels like all the same character. And, you know, getting to this point, it's a lot of this. It's all the simple round shapes and, you know, having fun with squash and stretch with that mustache and beard and keeping it simple and then adding details on where they need to be, and then you have something that feels, you know, more complex and a lot more entertaining, okay? Learning cute. That was a big thing for me. I, I had a hard time. Uh, I had a hard time with feminine shapes, and I had a hard time with cute shapes. Um, you know, I, when I was growing up, I would sit. I couldn't afford to buy any books, so I would go to the bookstore, and there is this Frank Frazetta book. And I would, and I'd go in when I was in middle school and high school, and I'd get this Frazetta book, and, and I always prayed no one bought it. Please don't, no one bought it, no one bought it. And I'd get it off the shelf, and I would sit, and I'd go through that book page by page, and I'd copy all the drawings. And, and uh, the book got worn out because it was me that kept going in there. <laughs> but I ended up, you know, by the time I went to college, I had all these big, massive, you know, muscular, barbarian-type characters in my head, and I really struggled with doing the opposite of that. And since then, obviously, I've had to, you know, and, and you will at some point in your career as a designer or an animator have to do something that's cute and soft and, and appealing in that way. And, um, and so understanding baby proportions and cute proportions are really, first of all, it's fun. And second of all, it just, it'll really help you, you know, fill out your library. And one of the things I find really interesting is just the idea of why you know, from a scientific standpoint, why these proportions are appealing. They literally trigger chemical changes in our brain when we see these types of proportions. That's why, you know, a human baby, a puppy, uh, a, a baby duck, a baby elephant, they all have the same proportions as babies, and we all react to them the same way. You want it, it triggers this, this nurturing instinct in your brain. And I find that really interesting, so that 
You know, you go from really cute little babies and you put the same proportions on a little elephant and you go, oh, or you put it on a puppy. It's all, it's all the same, it's all the same reactions. And, and all I'm doing is taking, I'm just changing the species, but keeping the proportions. And it's all, and you, and it just triggers this little thing in your brain. So it's a, it's a fun thing to do. Another thing is moving the eye. You know, and you'll get that with good strong lines of action that I already talked about. Um, but there's also things I like. This is an example that I did. This is really complex, and and some people can call. I I've gotten into debates on, on this whether or not it really moves the eye in the way that I talk about. But I think it kind of does. I was doing this this bluesy type character design. And obviously when you're looking at it, you don't have any music. I didn't have anything to play. So I wanted your eye to move around kind of rhythm rhythmically, like he's playing guitar. And so I did things purposely so that the eye would flow. Like if you, oh, I'm sorry, doggone it. Let me go back, there we go. <clears throat> so there's the blues guy I was just talking about. Um, so if you like, if you look at the lapel on this coat, first of all, you know, your eye kind of travels around the hat and you go down the lapel of his coat and that wraps into the wrinkles in his leg and it just kind of, everything just kind of flows into one another. And that was the idea. Um, and if you look at, oh my gosh, come on. There we go. You know, everything just kind of flows in this way. And, um, and so any way, you know, anytime you can get that eye to move um, through line of action, through, uh, you know, guiding the eye through, through folds and things like that, like I've done here, um, you know, it always helps. Small changes make big differences. So what do I mean by that? Um, I was talking about that a little bit earlier, like with uh, facial expressions. The tiniest little changes can make really big differences. Um, uh, whether it's, you know, the tilt of an eyebrow, you know, any of those things, it, it, they really, really help. Um, but this one here I want to talk about, and, and that is, oh my gosh, it's just not... I don't know if it's the hookup. There we go. Let me just push that in a little bit. So exp exploiting the paradox in a character. Now this comes with the writing of a character, so you have to you have to get in there and and uh, if you're writing the character, think about this. This is something I always think about. Every character has some type of, at least the more interesting ones in my mind, have some kind of paradox to them. And what I mean by that, take the 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 gangster on the left who loves kittens. You know, it's. It's that kind of idea. He's got a soft spot in his heart. He goes out and puts a bullet in somebody's head, but he comes back and, you know, cuddles with his little kitten at night. You know, or the little girl who, you know, loves to wear pink, gets in there and, and loves to box. Um, it's those types of things that, that really are, are a lot of fun and, and really great to explore and, 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 uh, and exploit. Um, another big one is props and costumes. Uh, obviously with costumes, you know, it's when you're designing a character, they're going to be wearing a certain thing within the world that you're creating. But also props. Anytime you can get a prop in there, it really helps. And um, here's an example here where, once again, when it's all kind of pulled together, you kind of take everything for granted, but there's a lot of thought that go went into this drawing. Uh, first of all, the posture and the silhouette. I really wanted everything to work the right way. Overlapping shapes. Um, uh, if you look at the way I'm, uh, the way I, I drew this, I purposely had everything leading, the eye should be lead, leading right to her lips on the spoon. You know, if you look at the lines on the hat, they go right down the hat to the lips. The arm points right at the at the the uh, the lips, and if you look at the line of action through the body, it all goes right to the spoon and her lips. So there's that. There's the expression. Okay, she doesn't know what if it's you know if it's gonna how it's gonna taste. There's all kinds of little stories that go in here. So there's the and you know who she is, right? She's a chef, and in my mind, she she's a, a chef that's uh, in in learn in, uh, in uh, school. We've got the pot on the so there's our prop. We got the pot on the on the stove. You got all these little things that help tell a little bit of a story, and that's the thing you uh, you know you want to get across. So much of character design, or at least for me, the best character designs are not just. A character on on a model sheet it's you know you if you really understand who the character is you can get that character into situations and poses that will help tell the story and you get something out of that as a viewer you learn something new okay who's that it's the mean librarian isn't it we've all run into her at least back in the days when we went to libraries right 
but I mean, I, I think her, she's probably said shush about 100,000 times. You know, so it's, and everything I tried to do on this, you know, I tried to support her character. Everything's very tight, prim, and proper, and tight-lipped, and, you know, her hair is just so, and all that kind of stuff. You know, so I, I really thought about her costume. I really, you know, having those books as props, and how you know she's a librarian. Not just one book, one book wouldn't have done it. A stack of books does it. You know, it's those little things. So this is one. This is such a simple prop, but it, it says so much. It, it gives the, the, the drawing a little bit of a story. So if, if you didn't have the stick there, he's just a happy little dog wagging his tail, which is cool. That's great. But now he, now he wants to play. Maybe he brought it to you. He's, there's all kinds of things that just by adding that stick that, that add to the story. And so that's what I'm trying to get across. If you can you know, add these little props, it really helps with, with your design. We've all dealt with this dude before, or at least I did in Florida, you know, growing up. I, heck, I went to school with these guys. So, <laughs> but, you know, he's, you've got the, the greasy outfit, the, the tire, the wrench. You know, we all know he's, he, he works at a, at a garage. You know, all that stuff. It tells the story, okay? There's nothing on there as far as logos or anything that else like that that tells you he works at a garage. But there's all these little clues that tell you. And so that's, that's what I'm talking about. And here we got this very elegant, this one I, I included just because I felt like it had nice gesture to it and, and fluidity. The wine snob, you know, the, the guy at the wine tasting that, you know, turns his nose up at everything, twirling the water and turn, twirling the wine, that sort of thing. And I tried to get a nice, you know, th it's a fluid gesture. I tried the line of action I tried to get in there, but also very stiff and, and upper crust. There's another one. That I'm just having fun with character design, but adding a, you know the little cup of tea adds to it. So this is something I want to talk about, and, and this is I'm, I want to talk about in uh, for character design, and it goes hand in hand with what I was just talking about here with costumes and props. It takes it to the next step, and that's getting a tableau. Uh, a tableau is an image that tells a story, and anytime you can do that, you know storyboard artists do it all the time, obviously. But I think as character designers, we should be doing that as well. Think about that because, once again, as a character designer, when you're trying to get your character des uh, design approved by an art director, a director for yourself, um, anytime you can get some kind of tableau, uh, you know, maybe a character interacting with another character from, from whatever project you're working on, you help support the story. You help propagate ideas. And, uh, and if, rather than just creating you know, a mannequin, a two-dimensional mannequin, now you want to take it as far as you can. So you guys are, are, are all of you familiar with Norman Rockwell, who Norman Rockwell was? He, uh, uh, for years and years, he, he illustrated for the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, he's one of the greatest American illustrators we've ever had, uh, you know, all the way through from the early 1910s up through the 70s. And um, as a kid, you know, he was still alive and painting when I was young, and I was just fascinated by him. But he was a master at creating an image and telling a story. Just an absolute ma master. Narrative images, we call them. I don't have to say anything. You can look at this one image and you get an entire story of what happened. In about five seconds, you know what happened. You know the type of girl she is. You know her personality. You know where she is. You know what happened. She got into a fight. She's at the principal's office. She's a, she's a tomboy. She's rough and tough. She's really has, you know, she maybe got caught, caught one in the eye, but she got the better of the other girl because, first of all, she's at the office and not the other girl or other person. Who knows? It may have been a, may have been a boy. And you can see the vice principal, the principal. All these, you, you, I, I, I've, had, I have a whole scene in a movie that pops into my head, all from this one image. That's, that's amazing. We take it for granted when we see it because it's so clear. But you got to really think about the amount of work that goes into creating that amount of clarity. You know, there's a, there's a great quote from, I'm going to mess up the quote, but there's a great quote from Mark Twain. That uh, was, uh, he wrote a letter to somebody, and he says, I'm really sorry about the length of the letter. I didn't have time to write something shorter. And it's that idea of sitting there and taking the time and, and whittling it down and getting it as clear and concise and as perfect as you can make it. And the same thing goes for creating a visual, you know, a, an, an image, a narrative image. This one's awesome. And for those, those of you in the back, I don't know how well you can see it. What day is it? It's Sunday, of course. They're going to church. 
He's sitting there reading the Sunday paper. He's wearing red. It's so funny. He's, look at his hair. He's got devil horns in his hair. <laughs> you know, it, there, and, you know, mom's, she's got an attitude. She can't believe it. He's smoking a cigarette, drinking his coffee. I mean, it's, it's a really cool, cool image. I love it. You know, here, uh, here's one from, 19, or from war, World War II. Um, there's the soldier, uh, soldier on the left, and he's holding a Japanese flag. He's come back from war. Um, you can see in the, there's a newspaper up on the wall in the upper right. Uh, it says, Garage Man, a Hero. That's a, that's a really important little piece of information for this image because now you see that he's come home, so something's happened while he was in the war, and he's telling the story to these guys about how he became a, a hero. So it's, there's a lot there. Look at this one. What just happened? Yeah, his dreams are shattered. Yeah, he's figured it all out. Once again, it's just an amazing, beautiful narrative image. And so these are the types of things that, you know, if you can, if you have the ability in, in while, you know, when doing your designs, um, or even beyond just doing st uh, 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 character designs when you're storyboarding or whatever it is you're doing, you know, what we create are narrative images. And so the more you can put into your narrative images to tell a story, the better off you are. Don't, reali no, don't always rely, rely on the cut to a new shot, the cut to a new shot, and the cut to a new shot. You can, there's so much you can tell, you know, visually. It's one of the things, I, I can't stand lazy screenwriting, you know, when people give exposition verbally. There's so much you can tell, you know, like right here. We didn't have to say a word, but you, you, you got the whole thing. This one here, too. I just love this image. Little grandma, you know, working class bar or uh, the diner. Uh, just, it's great. This one always makes me tear up. I had a daughter, you know, my daughter, you know, hitting that age. And she's caught. She's, she, she's stuck between, you know, being a little girl and, and wanting to be a woman. And it's just, a, she's got her doll, you know, that doll is a really big prop right there. But then she's also got lipstick and, and the hair comb and everything else. It's really cool. So this is, um, uh, you guys familiar with Wolf Walkers, the film? I did a tiny little bit of, of uh, work on Wolf Walkers, literally for a couple of weeks. Uh, but I like to use this because Wolf Walkers, my natural style is more of a naturalistic style. I don't, um, uh, for, for what I design, when I design for animation for my own stuff, it tends to be more naturalistic. And so when Tom Moore, uh, the director of Wolf Walkers, asked me to do some stuff for them, I saw it as a real challenge because that film is really pushed in its design. And, uh, and I, I, I got really excited about it. But like anything else, I started out really looking at, you know, realistic wolves. I wanted to understand how wolves were built. These are all little sketches. These are actually, I, I have a course on how to draw wolves, coyotes, and foxes, and these are all excerpts from that. I love to start with the bone structure and get into the musculature and, and you know, get to the outside. Um, and understanding how all the different parts work. These are all little observational sketches that I do in order to understand before I start pushing the designs. These are all sketches done from that. And so then I asked Tom to send me, you know, what are some of the design conceits? What, what are they, what's the art director doing? And so he sent me a bunch of stuff and I started taking that and digesting it and taking all this real world knowledge that I have in my brain and how do I kind of start digesting that and re you know, regurgitate something that fits in the film. And so, and it, for me, it's always a gradual process. I have to get there. I can't just get there. I have to, especially in my brain when I'm drawing like this, I have to push it a little bit, and then push it a little bit, and push it a little bit, and eventually, eventually get there. And so these were lots and lots of little character drawings and sketches that I did, you know, along the way. This is super realistic compared to what was in the film. But ultimately, as I pushed myself, um, I was able to get. I actually got this far. This is where I, I took it to. Um, which is still a lot more dimensional than what they had in the film. I love the graphic quality of the, of the film. I ended up giving like some lectures on, uh, you know, locomotion and things like that 
for them. But it was so much fun to kind of go from that realistic character to something that's a little flatter and more designy like these characters here. But I couldn't have gotten here had I not done that research I was talking about before. So, so important. Okay? And creating a model sheet, too. I mean, this goes without saying. We create model sheets when we, when we do our character designs. But, w you know, when I do create a model sheet, and when you're forced... A, a model sheet, first of all, let me back up. A model sheet is there to give information to other artists on how to draw or what a how a character should be, how, it, how should they should look or whatever. And so because of the, the nature of a model sheet, it has to give information. And so you, as the creator of a model sheet, it's going to force you to explain why you're doing what you're doing. And so it really is a good exercise so that you understand why you're doing what you're doing and how you construct it and all that, all that kind of stuff. So this is um, Peter and the Wolf. Uh, I have a character design course on my website. And, uh, and so we took Peter and the Wolf, and I did some designs of Peter and, um, and the Wolf. And, um, and these were the model sheets that, that I ended up putting together for that course. And, um, and it's a fun process to do. And I really recommend it. If you're in between projects, grab a book that you love, you know, a story that you love. You know, Game of Thrones. I mean, that's, that's a fun one. And just uh, no matter what it is. And, and make, you know, see what you can do with coming up with characters. Uh, well, here you go. Try designing characters from a book. I'm talking about, oh, there it is. It didn't do it again. There we go. There. Designing characters from a book. This is Moby, Moby Dick. This is another one that I did. Uh, Captain Ahab. And, uh, you know, he's a very rigid, sharp, you know, edged character. So I wanted his design to reflect that. But then you had Queequeg, who was, you know, more nature-bound and, and uh, more, you know, the savage, as they call him in the, in the book. Oh, my gosh. Sorry, you guys. So there's Queequeg. And so he's ra more rounded and more organic and, uh, you know, uh, not as rigid. Excuse me. Not as rigid. Then there's Moby Dick himself, you know, having fun with that. So... And once again, I mean, this wasn't for any project. It was just something that I, di I did it for my character design course, but it was just fun to do. And you really learn a lot when you do stuff like this. It's, it's, a, it's a, lot, a lot of fun. And then the other thing, too, I, and I, I do it as an animator, obviously. I like to animate my own characters. But even if you're not an animator, it's kind of fun to learn the basics, especially if you're a character designer. If you understand what an animator has to deal with um, with your designs, the better off you are. You can design better characters. So even if you're animating simple things, um, it'll be cool. Um, I'm right now. I'm in the middle of creating uh, a 10-minute short. I've been working on it for a couple of years, uh, but hopefully we're going to finish it next year. Called Snow Bear. And um, and this is the character that I designed for it. And even though I did, you know, I directed for six years. I, I directed uh, Brother Bear. I still went off uh, when we came to this and studied specifically polar bears and for, for a few months before I started designing. So I knew, you know, I have polar bears in my brain. And, um, and then I sat down once I had the design and thought I'd, you know, just animate a little bit of a character piece so the viewers and myself through this exploration could see who he is. And this is a, a little bit of him here. All pantomime. <laughs> so really, I just I just sat down and I started thinking about okay, I've got this polar bear, and I want him to have fun in the snow. And I thought about dogs when they go out in the snow and they see that first snow for the first time, they go bounding out in the snow, and that's that's what I was looking for in this attitude. So that's that's where it came to. Um, uh, you know, th this is uh, this is a character that I uh, I was directing a film for Digital Domain uh, about ten years ago uh, called The Legend of Tembo. Th the company ended up going bankrupt, so the film never got made. But these are some designs that I did for Tembo, and then uh, this is one of the f this is actually the first piece of digital animation I ever did where I was wasn't animating on paper, um, and uh, but I wanted to. You know, this little elephant, he loves, he's fascinated by bugs. He's like this little, he's like this little boy that just loves to catch bugs. And so I thought I'd animate this little character piece because 
I was working really close with the modelers and the and the the texture artists and everything else and, and um the and the riggers I should say sorry the modelers and the riggers and um and I I I was struggling with telling them what I was looking for once again you know my language is it's visual right so I said look let me just sit down and I can animate the movement and the character and what I'm looking for and they go oh, okay and so I I took several days and I did this and brought it back and they they actually built it and animated it in 3D it was really cool. This is his little character following around this little bug. I didn't get his tail done, but it's just a tiny little shot. <laughs> but just super simple. But it was fun, you know, I purposely had him turn around 360 in space so you could get a sense of his form and his character. So it's these little things that, that can really help in your design, you know, when you're doing this. Um, during Mulan, I, uh, okay, gotcha. I'll, I'll wrap it up. <laughs> um, I got one more to show you, and then we have to go. But during Mulan, uh, uh, I had a character. I did Yao, the, uh, one of the Gang of Three, and, uh, and this main ancestor. And this is one of my early um, tests. I know I'm not there yet, but here it is. <laughs> Oops. Oop, let me go back. Sorry. Here it is. And right there. There it is. So this is a quick test. I think I, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it or not. Bisks are high, a three boy type of race. And that's not even the design that ended. That's not the design that ended up in the movie. And so a lot of times we'll do the the tests, and then you know we'll end up doing designs after that. This was pretty much the whole thing. I only had a couple more shots to show you. We're we're getting shuffled out, but. Um, anyway, I was a little bit long-winded today, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, thanks so much for coming out.